Well, welcome back. We're finishing up today the last part of the beautiful little book of Malachi, last book of the Old uh, Testament. And uh, we're just going to be um, going through a bunch of great verses uh, tonight. So glad you're uh, joining us. Glad you're here. Open up your Bibles, but before we do so, uh, let's talk to God. Your Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for this uh, book of the Old Testament, Malachi. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for leading and guiding and directing us. And, and Lord, it's been our prayer. Uh, we simply pray that as you speak, that your people would be listening. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. Again, a great little book. We're going to be starting at Malachi chapter 3, verse 13. And uh, we're going to go right to the end of the book. Let me jump right in. Uh, verse 13, uh, God is speaking. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? Uh, remember, uh, if you go back and, uh, just uh, uh, to the previous verses, verses 10 to 12, God is talking about blessing his people, just uh, enumerates all these incredible blessings that the people will experience. And he finishes that. And, and then he says, but you have spoken arrogantly uh, against I mean, God said, I'm going to pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. And then God says, you're speaking arrogantly against me. That word arrogant, it can also be translated harsh. You're speaking harshly against me or offensively. You're speaking offensively uh, against me. And, and the Lord is speaking this to his people that have he delivered from Egypt, then they delivered from the land of Babylon and they rebuilt the temple, they rebuilt the city and God just wanted it to be great for them. And yet in their stubbornness, they, they were rejecting him and, and, and they had this religion that was ritualistic and, and they had a sense of hopelessness even though they, they had the Lord God Almighty uh, on their side and these people uh, they, they were ignoring what God was doing, and they resented even God's charge. You, you can sense that in the, the question that they ask, what have we said against you? And, and, and again, the people in, in that question, they're, they're saying, God, you're mistaken. And we're right. So how dare you even bring that up? Malachi 3 verses 14 and 15, they kind of go together because God's going to answer the question, what have we said against you? Verse 14, you have said it is futile to serve God or it's, it's vain to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? For these people, Serving God, they were serving a God who demanded so much, and yet in their minds, he gave so little. They said, what's the use, they were saying. They, they speak about mourning. In the Old Testament, we know that the, uh, in, in lamenting or mourning, people would put on sackcloth, which was a coarse cloth, or, or they would uh, sit in, in ashes. They would walk in sackcloth they would sit in, in ashes but but i also believe that many were just doing that as an outside show uh, yeah i'm really sorrowful for what i had done and, and but the people were bringing this up they were saying hey we're doing this we're lamenting we're mourning and and, and yet uh, what what does it profit us we're following all the requirements what good is it that's what the people were saying, and that's what the Lord was bringing up. And then verse 15, but now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. 
So, so the, the people continue, and, and really it's, it's echoing what they had already said. If you go back to chapter 2, verse 17, you know, their complaint is, you know, these people, they're doing evil, and yet <coughs> they seem to be blessed. And, and, and so now they're, they're looking around at them, and, and uh, they're, they're noticing these other nations, these other people who are, who are serving these false gods. And, and they speak, first of all, of the, the arrogant or the proud. And the implication with that word is that they were boiling over in arrogance. I, I mean, they were looking at these people and they were going, they're not just arrogant, they're really arrogant. And, and, and they bring up and, and they say, why are they happy? They're blessed is the word that is used, but it also means happy. Why are they so happy? They're so arrogant, they're so proud. And, and then they speak of the, the evildoers, uh, the, those who are doing wickedness. And what do they say? Why are they prospering? Okay, God, we're, we're walking in sackcloth, sitting in ashes. We're mourning. We're, we're fulfilling all the requirements. It was ritualistic, but we're, fi we're filling all of them. And yet the arrogant are blessed. The evildoers uh, prosper. And then they bring up one more thing. They say, these people, they even, God, they put you to the test. They, uh, they challenge you, God. And yet, they get away with it. So what they're expecting is anybody that puts God to the test should be zapped. Failing to remember that they were putting God to the test. They were challenging God. So the people say, what, what are we saying against you? And God says, okay, here's what you're saying. Th this is your complaint. And then verse 16, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. There's a little kind of a switch going on here, right? God is talking to, to these uh, disobedient uh, Israelites uh, who, who are uh, questioning God and, and, and coming up with this complaint. And then he turns and God, he recognizes that there are still the faithful. If you go back in your Bibles uh, to 1 Kings chapter 19, you'll see that as well. A prophet by the name of Elijah. Elijah's going, I'm like, God, I'm the only one left. Nobody else loves you, follows you. And, and God, in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, he reminds Elijah that there are still 7,000 who have not bowed down to Baal or to this false god. The same is true here in, in, in Malachi. And so Malachi the prophet, he ought to know. There are still the faithful. And God speaks of the faithful in three different ways. First of all, he says, they are the ones who fear the Lord or they still stand in awe of God. He, said, he says, secondly, they speak to one another. Don't miss that. Um, I, I really believe that the faithful were encouraging one another, just like in the New Testament times. In, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And you, you had the faithful remnant in the time of Malachi. God was recognizing it. They feared the Lord. They spoke to one another. And God heard it. God listened. And then finally God says, they're the ones who honor my name. They bring honor to my name. They don't drag my name through the mud. They are the ones who hear that command. You shall not use God's name in vain. They were honoring it. It was a precious name and they called upon it. And then the Lord says, a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning them. And really this was a, a Persian practice. Uh, the, the Persians had all kinds of scrolls and all kinds of books where they would list people. So even the people who returned uh, to, the, to the land of Jerusalem, to the land of Judah, when they were returned, I'm sure they were all enumerated and, and you could find uh, those scrolls in the, the Persian records. 
Well, well, the Israelites, they would do the same thing. Not only that, God did. God speaks of a scroll of remembrance. And, uh, we're, we're reminded of, of the New Testament as well. If you go to Revelation uh, chapter uh, 20, God speaks of this book of life. Verses 12 to 15. And I, if you go to the book of Revelation, God is speaking to Christians who are being persecuted. And really it's a, a book that, that it, for some is rather mysterious, but for the people who, who received this book, it was a, a book of encouragement. In the midst of their trials, they heard from God. And God reminded them of the book of life. And, and it was an incredible promise in the midst of distress. And the same is true with the people in Malachi's time, those who were faithful. God spoke of a scroll of remembrance. Your name is there. Whatever you're going through, people, they're mocking you, persecuting you, your name's in the book. Life is difficult, life is hard, your name's in the book. And no one, no thing can erase it. God put it there by his grace. And it's the book of life. And so God reminded the faithful of that. In verse 17, God says, on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves them. On the day when I act, so, so God, he says, I'm going to act, and when I act, they will be my treasured possession. I believe God is speaking to the New Testament church as well, and he's speaking to us today. When God acts, you become his treasured possession. There is a great reminder here of God's adoption. It, it, is, it is God's love where, where he chose us. Riffraff, people who didn't deserve an ounce of goodness, and yet he adopted. And, and he didn't make us an adopted son or daughter. We became a son or daughter of the king. And not only that, he didn't just look at us as more of his family. He said, you are my treasured possession. So again, God is speaking to these people uh, who are faithful. And he's reminding them of their position. Verse 18, it says, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked between those who serve God and those who do not. I, I believe we'll see that on the final day. When, when Christ comes back, we're gonna see clearly the distinction between the righteous and, and, and the wicked. Well, the fact of the matter is, even in Malachi's time, you had these people who were Malachi writes down the word of God and he says, these people were speaking harshly or offensively, arrogantly against God. And, and, and the un unrighteous, they, they speak harshly against God. And the righteous will see. The righteous will see God's judgment clearly, especially on that day. And then, for us, that's the end of chapter 3, but just to let you know that if you go to a Hebrew Bible, there is no Malachi chapter 4. Instead, uh, what we have is Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. For them, it's verse 19 of, of chapter 3. I believe it was a, a man by the name of Robert Stephanus. It's oh, the uh, middle of the what, 16th century who came up with the chapters and, and the verses or, or the final kind of addition for us in the Old Testament and New Testament. And, and again, when God wrote the word, when the prophets wrote the word, there were no chapters, there were no verses. It was one long letter, it was one long book. Uh, but uh, the Hebrews, they decided they were just going to continue with chapter three. And we go to chapter four, but uh, Malachi four verse one, it says, surely the day is coming it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. 
And again, I really believe that God is pointing to that final day, that final day of judgment. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that God, when he's speaking to the people of Israel who, who claimed that they were being faithful, uh, who, who were going through the motions, who, who were saying, we're doing all these things, uh, God spoke of them as being arrogant. The, the people that God spoke of, of being arrogant, they looked at the nations around them. And, and they spoke of them as the arrogant. What does God say now? All the arrogant and every evildoer. And remember their complaint as well. They were saying that the arrogant, they're blessed, and the evildoers, they prosper. God says, okay, that's true. They're arrogant. Um, they are evildoers. I bless, um, I bless the farmer on this side of the fence as much as I bless the farmer on this side of the fence. Both prosper, even though one believes and one doesn't. That's just the way of God. But God says there will come a day when those who are arrogant, those who are evildoers, no longer will they prosper. And when you read these words, it seems rather harsh. We'll set them on fire. And a lot of people have trouble with this. They have trouble with the, the biblical uh, teaching of hell, that it's a place of fire and, and torment. And, and how could a loving God do that? Well, God is loving and God is merciful, but God is also just. And God has told us exactly what he does. Those who believe have eternal life in heaven. Those who do not believe they are dismissed, they are condemned, they go to this place called hell. Dante, um, years ago in the Inferno, tried to describe hell as this terrible place of fire and torment. I don't know if we can even begin to imagine. We speak of heaven in that way, right? There's that beautiful Christian song, uh, we can only imagine what it will be like, heaven. I believe that it will blow our imaginations away. I believe the same is true of hell. We can't even begin to imagine what that will be like. A place without God. Without God, there is evil. Without God, there is death. Without God, there is darkness. Without God, there is torment for eternity. Uh, Jesus speaks of it this way. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire. Not just the fire, the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark 9, verse 43. Jesus says, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. God is trying to describe the unimaginable. And so God, through the prophet Malachi, he is speaking not only to the Israelites who are arrogant, who could care less about God, but he's also speaking to the faithful and, and reminding them of what's true. R reminding them of the, the truth of God's word. And then you get to verse 2. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like the well-fed calves. For those who revere my name, why doesn't it say, for those of you who love me? It's true. Those who revere his name, they love him. But is it possible that even in our generation, we speak more of loving God? rather than revering God. And again, when you love him, you revere him. When you revere him, you love him. But that revere, it, it, it is that acknowledgement that when I stand before God, what do I say? Who am I? It's standing before God and going, your cross and your grace, it amazes me. To, to revere his name is to acknowledge that by his name we are saved. And, and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. It's to revere. 
It's to stand in awe. It's to fear. So God is speaking to them. And he says, the son of righteousness, I believe uh, this is a messianic prophecy once again. The Messiah, if you go to um, the, the book of Numbers 24, verse 17, the Messiah is referred to as the star out of Jacob. Isaiah speaks of the great light in, in Isaiah chapter 9. If you go to Isaiah 42, uh, he is referred to as the light of the Gentiles. If you go to Jeremiah, uh, he is the Lord our righteousness. So here is Malachi, and he says, well, here's what God told me to put down. The sun, the bright light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And, and we're reminded, this is Jesus, the light of the world. We're reminded of his righteousness. It's a personal righteousness. He did nothing wrong. He was perfect and holy in every way. But we're also reminded of, of his vicarious righteousness. It's a righteousness that he gives. It's a righteousness that, that he declares uh, to those that he calls by grace. Jesus died on the cross and he took our sins and those who believe get his righteousness. And, and we're reminded that when, when we have his righteousness, when we're covered with the holiness of Jesus, that is the ultimate healing. God heals physically. I know that full well. But the greatest healing is when sin is taken away and we are covered by the blood of Jesus. Now, there is a, a passage in Psalm 41, verse 4. Uh, David says, I said, have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. So, so David is recognizing my greatest sickness of sin. Heal me. The son of righteousness, I believe, arose with healing in its wings. And David, uh, he was healed by Jesus. And those who are healed, according to God, uh, they will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. And I don't know what that's like. Go to a farm, I guess, and just look at a well-fed calf and, and watch as they jump about. And, and, and that's the people of God set free. Well, how can that be? Because the people of God are persecuted and the people of God experience things that are difficult and hard. They experience sickness and they experience death. And yet in the midst of the, the, the morning, there is joy. In the midst of the darkness, there's light. And, and, and for the people of this world, so often they look at a Christian, they go, how can it be that way? Well, it's because the son of righteousness arose in my life with healing in his wings. And I've been set free to frolic like a well-fed calf. And verse 3 says, Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be like ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. And uh, make, makes it sound like we're going to step on people. Well, how about this? The Bible says that when we respond in a gracious way, we heap coals upon a person's head. And it's just that recognition that that person who is evil, that person who is persecuting us, when they see that we don't react like they expected us to react, it's, they are frustrated. And they are angered by that. And I believe that the God of grace touches people and they show grace. And, and the wicked are trampled under feet, but it's not by our strength. Romans chapter 7, verse 18, it says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Paul is just simply saying, I can't do that. But then there's a famous verse, Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength to, to live this way, to be a child of God in a broken world. But Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19. Um, just take note of that verse as well. It says, they will fight against you, but will not overcome you. God says, for I am with you and will rescue you. 
So suddenly the tables are turned. They're going to fight against you, the wicked, the evil. But God says, they're not going to overcome you. You're going to overcome. You are overcomers in the name of Jesus. Because God says, for I'm with you and I will rescue you. In the strength of their Savior, healed by his righteousness, from sin and guilt, from fear and cowardice, they shall go forth joyously, courageously, sheep for the slaughter, yes, yet more than conquerors. Verse 4, remember the law of my Moses, servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. So he's speaking to the faithful as well, and he's saying, remember, he's, it's not a question, by the way. You know, do you remember them? He's saying, it's a command, it's a statement. Remember them. Okay, so remember what I said. And this includes the moral law, the ceremonial law of this time, the political laws. God wanted the best for his people. God says, remember that. Uh, live this way. He wanted them to be distinguished from the people of this world. A, a people who were called out of this world, who were different. So, so instead of listening to, to the Israelites who were falling away and, and living like the world, God is saying, no, I want you to remember what I said to Moses on, on Mount Sinai, how I made you my people. Then verse 5, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Um, and again, this is John the Baptist, and that's that reference. He, he's the second Elijah. I'm going to send Elijah. And so often in prophecy, the coming of Jesus in the flesh and, and his coming on that last day, uh, so often in prophecy, it's seen as one um, you know, great panoramic view. It's all kind of tied together. And, and, and those uh, who recognize the first coming, they're ready for the second coming. And, and so God, he, he's speaking of the coming of Jesus. John the Baptist would not only announce his coming, but prepare the way. But God is also speaking of that, that final coming. When, when Jesus will return and he says, I'm going to send Elijah to you for that great and, and dreadful day. But for the people of God, it will be a great day. Dreadful in that God and his judgment will come. But for those who believe, they're going to be judged righteous because of what Jesus has done. Then finally, Malachi 4 verse 6 says, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. It doesn't say, you know, I will uh, turn uh, the attention of the parents to their children. It's the hearts of parents to their children. Folks, you can look at this in one of two ways. First of all, uh, maybe from a, a kind of an immediate that God was speaking to the faithful and, and God was saying, here, here, here's what I want. I want parents, their hearts, to turn to their kids and to understand that the best thing they can give to their kids are spiritual blessings rather than, you know, always a physical blessing. These are parents who recognize that discipline is necessary. Their hearts turn to their kids and they understand that they have been given this incredible responsibility for their kids. But then kids will also turn their hearts to their parents. And God, he's this pointing to those families. This is the way he wanted to be. That, that the kids would look at mom and dad as being old fashioned or way too conservative. We're gonna live a liberal way. God is looking at, at kids who will turn to their parents and go, yes, what you have, um, I receive the, the, the message of, of God. But you can also look at this as the forefathers, you know, the, the, the people of old, and, and, and they will turn their hearts to the children, to generations after them, and, and encourage them on to be faithful. And then the kids will look at these uh, faithful people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and, and Joshua, and Hezekiah, and King Josiah, and all those faithful, and the kids will turn to the parents and go, yes, the way you lived, to honor and to revere the name is the way we will live to honor and revere the name of the living God. And, and God is just saying, that's, that's what I see with my faithful remnant. Then it ends with 
this word of judgment. And it's interesting because the prophecy of Isaiah ends the same way. So before you criticize Malachi, remember Isaiah, you know, kind of the beloved prophet, one of the major prophets. He ends uh, Isaiah 66 verse 24. It's a, it's a word of judgment. It's harsh. Malachi ends the same way. Did you know the Masoretes who uh, faithfully um, wrote the Old Testament in, in Hebrew, made copies of it? They had trouble with this. And so what the Masoretes, some of them did, was after they um, wrote down verse 24, they wrote verse 23 again. And, and so you know, they didn't want to end with this sour note. So let's, let's, they did 23, 24, 23. The Septuagint, which is really the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew, is translated from Hebrew into Greek. Uh, what they did was they just reversed 23 and 24. Now, you, you can't do that. This is God's word. So what's God doing here? Uh, let me share it with you this way, okay? It ends with this judgment. God wants repentance. God wants people to, to fall to their knees and say, I'm broken. Like David, I, I need the healing because I'm a sinner. God, you just spoke this word of judgment. It's harsh. I fall to my knees and I, I truly repent. I'm sorry and I turn to you now. And that's exactly what God wants. But today for us, I believe God would say, but then turn the page. Now you can do it physically. Okay, it ends with judgment. God says, okay, you're judged. You're sorry for your sins. You're broken. Turn the page. You turn the page. And it starts a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It is so cool that God orchestrated not, not only the, the total writing of this book from beginning to end, it's His. Every last word, every jot and tittle belongs to God. But I believe He also orchestrated how this book would be put together. The Old Testament, New Testament ends with judgment, a call to repentance, turn the page. Jesus Christ. Jesus means one who saves. Christ means the promised one. The promised one who saves. I believe that really the prophecy of Malachi, in some respects, it is the is the prophecy of John the Baptist, the second Elijah, preparing the way for the Lord, call to repentance. And then John one day turned the page and said, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. What a great book. What a great Bible. Folks, in, in, in concluding, I just wanted you to know that uh, we're going to have another class. It's going to be taught by Paul Luddington. Uh, he's going to go through the book of uh, Nehemiah, but in a different way. Uh, it's going to be a, a Zoom class, not Zumba, a Zoom class. And uh, in order to, to be a part of it, uh, you have to register so that you can receive the Zoom code. So go to our, our, our website and check out that information so that you can uh, register and, 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 and study with Paul as he goes through uh, the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Let's bow our heads to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, uh, in this uh, study of the book of Malachi, I just pray that you would have the final word. And so, Lord, uh, may I in this prayer just declare the final word. Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. God bless you.